Hello, I'm Dr. Fergus Donohoe, and you're watching For the Love of Wisdom, my YouTube channel on free thought, philosophy, and critical thinking. In this video, we're going to begin to look at the rule of universal generalization. This is one of our quantification rules for predicate logic, and it lets us go from a particular statement to a universal statement. But there are restrictions on how it's used, and we'll learn about those in this video. In the previous video, we learned about the predicate logic and the rule of universal instantiation, another one of our quantification rules for predicate logic. And in the previous videos before that, we have been learning about sentential logic. Sentential logic differs from predicate logic by focusing on the logical relations between sentences, but it leaves the content of the sentence uh, as a black box. It doesn't tell us what the, a sentence actually says, and it doesn't factor that into the logic. Okay, let's now consider this argument. All calicos are felines. All felines are animals. Therefore, all calicos are animals. Uh, as you can see, these are all universal statements, which we learned about in the previous video. And this time, the conclusion is a universal statement. In the previous video, we had universal premises, but our conclusion was still a particular conclusion. Okay, so we're going to need a new rule to get our universal conclusion. And that's the rule of universal generalization. So let's take a look at how this is going to be symbolized. We have, we remember we use the upside down A to represent a universal and we're using that with the variable X. So X is the variable that is bound to the quantifier. And our first premise, all calicos are female, our felines says that for every X, if X is a calico, then X is a feline. And our next premise, all felines are animals, says that for any x, if something is a feline, if x is a feline, then x is an animal. And our conclusion is going to be, for any x, if x is a calico, then x is an animal. So what are we going to do here? First, we're going to do universal instantiation on this twice. Um, we learned that rule in the previous video, and we get if CA, then FA, and on line four, we get if FA, then AA. And then on line five, we use a hypothetical syllogism to get if CA, then AA. And that lets us have what we need to do a universal generalization. And so we take uh, this constant or variable here, and we substitute every instance of it with the letter X, which we have bound to the universal quantifier here. And so we get that through the rule of universal generalization. And what you've just seen is a valid instance of the rule of universal generalization. There are going to be uh, invalid uses of it too. But let me explain what's going on here. A here is not a particular individual. It's an arbitrary individual who represents uh, anybody at all whom our first premise could be true of. And we don't know anything about A except that line one is true of A. We don't know if A is a calico or a cat or a dog or a flea or a mite or a paramecium or anything. We don't know anything about A, except that one number one is true of it. So in that sense, it represents everyone that our line one refers to. And if we can show anything about A to be true, then it will follow that it's true of everything that was referred to in the universal that we got A from. When we instantiated A, we instantiated to an arbitrary individual. Okay, and that's very important. We have to 
use an arbitrary individual whenever we use the rule of universal generalization. We cannot go from a statement about a particular individual to a universal statement. That would be invalid. So let's consider this argument right here, which is very similar to the one we just looked at. It says, all calicos are felines. If Holly is a feline, then Holly is an animal. Here she is. Therefore, all calicos are animals. Okay, and that argument looks very similar to the one we just did. We have as our first premise uh, for any x, if x is a calico, then x is a feline. Our second premise is if Holly is a feline, then Holly is an animal. And we want to prove the same conclusion. Uh, all calicos are animals. So we use universal instantiation on line three to Holly this time, and we get if Holly is a calico, then Holly is a feline. And we use hypothetical syllogism as we just did before. And we get if Holly is a calico, then Holly is an animal. And then our conclusion is uh, for any x, if x is a calico, then x is an animal. But this is an invalid use of the rule of universal generalization because Holly is a particular known individual. And we cannot go from a particular known individual to a universal. So universal generalization is not allowed unless the subject is an arbitrary individual. By being arbitrary, an arbitrary individual remains indistinct from any particular individual allowing us to make a generalization. And let's look at a more concrete, a simpler example of this. We have as our premise, Holly is a calico and we want to conclude everything is a calico. Well, that's obviously invalid. And the rule of universal generalization is not going to let us do that. Now, an arbitrary subject can be introduced by universal instantiation, as we've already seen, or by an assumption. Here's an example of uh, introducing it through an assumption. So, we want to prove the theorem for any x, uh, px or not px. And we're going to start with an assumption. We assume pa. And that's where our conditional proof and that conditional proof is just going to give us if PA, then PA. Okay. And then through material implication, we'll get not PA or PA. Through commutation, we'll just switch the position so we get PA or not PA. And finally, we use universal generalization to get uh, for any X, PX or not PX. So in this example, A is introduced through an assumption rather than through universal instantiation. And that's all right. If, if when we make the assumption, we're assuming that A here is an arbitrary individual. Okay, but sometimes you cannot um, use an individual introduce an assumption with the rule of universal generalization. And this argument will explain why that's wrong sometimes. Consider this argument. Not everything is wonderful, therefore nothing is wonderful. Well, that's an invalid argument. Uh, there may be some wonderful things even if not everything is wonderful. But here's how you could prove this you, uh, by misusing the rule of universal generalization. So let's look at our premise first. Our premise is the negation of everything is wonderful. And we want to conclude that for every x, x is not wonderful. So you can see, the, uh, symbolically, these two are very different from each other. And we, we're going to start by assuming wa, uh, which says a is wonderful. And then through universal generalization, we get for any x, uh, x is wonderful. So we get, as our conclusion for by conditional proof, if A is wonderful, then everything is wonderful. That seems wrong. Uh, let's continue here. Then we get uh, not WA through modus tollens from lines one and four. 
So you see line one is denying the consequent of line four, and so that lets us get the denial of its antecedent. And then we just universally generalize that, and we get uh, for any x, x is not w. Okay, so one of these instances of universal generalization is wrong, but which one is it? Um, maybe you want to pause the video right now and try to figure that out. And the answer is that the first instance of universal generalization is wrong. Uh, the rule is that we're not allowed to use universal generalization within the scope of an assumption where the subject appears within the scope of the assumption. And if you take a look at what we got on line four by conditional proof, that's clearly wrong. Um, we're now treating A, even, even though we started to assume that A was an arbitrary individual, on line four it seems as though A is a particular individual. And it's saying if A is wonderful, then everything is wonderful. And of course that's just wrong. So yeah, on line three, we cannot use universal generalization because on line two, uh, that's within the scope of the assumption, and also line three is within the scope of the assumption. So that's an illegal use of universal generalization. Okay, so we've just learned about the rule of universal generalization, and it has a couple of restrictions on it. Uh, you know, here's the rule written with some Greek letters here. We have find new, therefore, for any mu, phi mu. And phi here represents uh, any predicate or any complex predicate, uh, any complex term that involves the variable or constant nu. And when we use universal generalization, we want to replace every instance of nu here with an instance of mu. I mean, it, whatever mu is going to happen to be. Uh, if we bind, if we, if we use the variable x with our universal, then we'd want to turn it into x. I mean, normally you're not going to have nu and mu in your actual proofs. These are just Greek letters standing in for what you would normally have there. Okay, so to recap, the restrictions on universal generalization are that the name nu must identify an arbitrary subject, which may be done by introducing it with universal instantiation, the rule we learned in the previous video, or with an assumption. And we learned about making assumptions in a previous video on conditional proof. And it may not be used in the scope of an assumption on a subject within that scope. Okay, in the subsequent video, we're going to be looking at the rules of existential instantiation and existential generalization. So you've been watching For the Love of Wisdom. And besides making videos on uh, logic, I do make videos on other subjects. Uh, here I have a video on critical thinking and religion. Here I have a video on the question, what do you think about pain? And this is the first video in a series of videos in which I'm asking uh, questions of the audience. And up here is, will be a link to the next video in this series after I've uh, made that video and put it up on YouTube. So until then, it's not going to link to anything. I want to remind you there's also going to be a text version of the video you just watched on my blog. You can check the description for the link and go there uh, to reinforce what you just learned here. And if you like this video, please favorite it or share it or like it down below. And to see more videos like this, please remember to subscribe to For the Love of Wisdom. That's all one word. And you have a button to do that right here. So thank you for watching.